Generator Quest, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And my name is Professor Mark Sheriff. And dun, 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 dun. Da, da, da. It's the Olympics, Will. It is the, the Olympics. Olympics. The Olympics have started. Are you a big Olympics fan at all? Um, not broadly, but on specific sports, I like to watch them. I, I, I have been a huge Olympics person slash kid going back to the mm-hmm. first Olympics. I remember is 88, the, the Seoul Korea Olympics. My elementary school class did a big unit on Olympics, and I got so into it. I was the kid that would set aside the old VHS tapes of movies that we didn't watch anymore so I could tape the Olympics uh, for no apparent reason. Apparently, I was going to watch them later. I'm not really sure why I did that, but I distinctly remember recording all these things. And, you know, this is Sammy's first Olympics that she's seeing, and she's so excited about it. And Will, I I don't know how to tell you this. But if you haven't been paying attention to the Tokyo Olympics, which apparently were in the past, but now are in the future, have so much going on for us. For instance, did you happen to hear or see anything about the Parade of Nations during the opening ceremony? Uh, I did not watch it, but I was I was aware that it wasn't it was it was heavily restricted because of the. Uh, COVID rules and uniquely in Japan it's a concern because they haven't gotten a lot of vaccines yet so even though they've never had a, a huge outbreak they've had that issue um, oh, oh yeah, yeah. What, oh, oh, anyway. oh, oh you, you, you're talking about bummers right now which by the okay. way yes watching any event and seeing no one in the seat is a bummer is a huge bummer I'm talking about the music it turns out that the music that they played f- during the Parade of Nations was the greatest hits from Japanese video games. So we had music from Chrono Trigger. We had music from Final Fantasy. Oh. We had music from Dragon Quest. And huh. I just, it, you know, here is the delegation from India coming into Frog's theme from Chrono Trigger. And it's just like, okay, that's uniquely Japanese and awesome. Did anyone, did anyone come into the, to the robot theme, which sounds a lot like Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up? That is a great mix, uh, mix, uh, mix up. If anyone wants to go see, I don't know if Robo's theme was part of it, but they did have the Final Fantasy fanfare music. That okay. dun, 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 yeah. dun, dun. so that was awesome. They also give every athlete a stuffy, uh, a very anime looking stuffy with their with their uh, little bouquet of sunflowers whenever they get their medal, which is super cute and also super Japanese and awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, Will I'm is not, just I, blinking I, at I'm me trying, right now. What, what is a stuffy? <laughs> It's like a stuffed, stuffed animal. animal. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's right. like yeah, a little stuffed animal. But I hadn't heard that uh, term before. So and, and, and so my my the, the girls in my household love watching the 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 gymnastics, but but Sammy got really excited about watching skateboarding. And this is the first Olympics that skateboarding, yep. street skateboarding was uh an official Olympic event. And during this Olympic event, we immediately noticed no one had on helmets. Yes. <laughs> and and we watched multiple people just eat it on the pavement. Wait, I mean, there, there's yeah. one, one particularly humorous, uh, white uh, yes, at one point, the, which, which was, you know yeah, what I'm talking one. about. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, the several uh, athletes stood up with like blood gushing down their arms. And even yep. the commentators said things like, Oh yes. And this athlete during the world championship, they told him if he had landed just a little bit to the left, he would have died. <laughs> and we're like helmet. So we looked it up. <laughs> We looked it up. Turns out that it's only required for skateboarders under the age of 18, which there are. And there's like 13 Correct. and 14 year olds on the, on the women's side. And when I was looking this up, I ended up on a Reddit thread where they were making an argument that, well, they don't make the gymnasts wear helmets. Well, the gymnasts aren't doing their tricks six feet above concrete. Yeah. I mean, common sense. And yeah. it was it was hilarious watching. Uh, Olympic athletes adjusting their AirPods as they're doing sweet tricks, yeah, because that is apparently allowed apparel. So, what? Well, so I, my my assumption there is they they have something akin to a planned routine, and the music is something of a helpful mnemonic device for that. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. As, as a street sport, uh, as an urban sport, it that has a part of it, but. 
I do have some questions we can talk. Olympic questions. Okay. And I got I got one of them for now, and we'll save one for another time. And this is actually not just limited to Olympics, but if you've ever watched, have you watched football, Will McBurney? Have you ever uh, seen? I have the, watched both versions of football. Yes. The, okay. As as a fan of the Mountaineers, you've in, you've enjoyed them romping across the green and. As they we have, all know, they have a very good uh, women's uh, football, aka American or uh, American soccer team as well. What we don't see as much of this particular thing with soccer. We did see it with NHL. Uh, mm-hmm. We did all the time see this with NFL, and we also see it with swimming with the Olympics. And that is the overlays. When you're watching an NFL game or a football game, you see the first down marker. You see right. the when you're watching Olympics now, we have those cool overlays mm-hmm. where we see here's where everyone is they're from. It's all cool, neat graphics. They dive in and it shows where the, the athlete is. And so let's talk about this. How do we do cool things like that at go time as we're going? Thoughts? That is actually something I've I've honestly pondered and don't know the answer to. I have some guesses which are probably wrong or hopefully wrong because, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's worth learning. How. So uh, let me specifically take swimming, um, mm-hmm. just because I think I think I'm probably close to right here. For instance, I was watching uh, Olympic swimming today. Not really watching. I just I had it on while I was. I was uh, working on something else, and I noticed that they had velocities in each lane, like superimposed over each lane. It it listed the swimmer's current velocity. Now, obviously, that's just with some, you know, I'm not talking about how they calculate velocity, but how do they superimpose velocity where it actually, like, is in that swimmer's particular lane? I assume that... They're using the visual markers of of the lane separators, which are which stand out, which are different from their surrounding and using that to kind of break up the screen automatically into different segments. And then from there, they just superimpose, you know, lane four's velocity over the segment for lane four, for example. Yeah, yep. so I mean, that. Yeah, that's basically the gist of it. You've got the right idea. I mean, first off. There is the notion of green screen technology. So, yeah. you know, the uh, let, let's start with that, which is, you know, this is every weather person you have ever seen, right? You see them in front of, hey, look, and here comes the the warm front that's going to give us a derecho on Friday. You know, that sort of person. All that is, is that is a TV monitor over. To, that's a computer mm-hmm. image that's being projected. And then the weather person is standing in front of literally a piece of green uh, cloth now, why or or some other sort of fabric? Blue is also often used, but green is the most common mm-hmm. one. Why green? Well, theoretically, there's no green of that pigment in anyone's skin tone. Right. So, regardless of uh, a person's ethnicity or their, their their particular skin tone, the green we don't have any aliens, green aliens, and that's not an issue. So this is one reason why whether people should never wear green suits. Mm-hmm. Um, which there have if you Google any such mishap you'll find it so this is you take the raw image the raw footage of the person in front of the green screen Mm -hmm. you take on the other hand you take the footage of the picture whatever it might be Mm -hmm. and you effectively do a a, a, an addition if you want to think of it that way if you 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 say okay the upper left pixel of both of those if one of them is green take the other one okay And by doing this, you can effectively add two images together. And this is something we teach, or I taught, I taught my CS1 students to do it. I don't know if you did or not, but Mm -hmm. we did, we did green screen images. So the the notion of taking the two things and superimposing them, that's easy. Doing it dynamically, that gets harder. So what you're telling me is that the Olympic swimmers weren't actually swimming. That was just the green screen. Just a green screen. It's been just like the the moon landing. Yeah. Fake the whole time. Yeah. Not didn't happen. None of it happened. Another piece of <laughs> wow, I'm gonna use air quotes here. Ancient technology, the connect from Microsoft with the original mm-hmm. X with not the original Xbox, Xbox One. Um the those well, sorts it was of it, Xbox three sixty had a connect. Oh gosh, that. right. It was three sixty. Yeah. And then it, it, it they also released they, it for they Xbox One as well. With the, yeah. Yeah. 
So those sorts of motion cameras mm-hmm. uh, work in different ways. They can use infrared. They can use a couple different types of camera manipulation. But one thing they could do is look for basically differences in um, coloration, like stark differences. So it's effectively looking for dividing places. And you're right. You can look for those, um, the lane markers, mm-hmm. and that that helps figure out exactly where the adjustment, where the, the split needs to be to put one graphic, one spot, one graphic, another, another spot. And so it actually takes a lot of computing power, mm-hmm. still a lot of computing power to do this in real time. As a matter of fact, I mean, most of these are on a bit of delay right. so that the processing can take place and then the finished product is put out. It's harder in the NFL because they're playing on green grass and so some yeah. of the greening can be tough mm-hmm. and um, you don't have full lines up and down. So you right. do have you, the down markers mm-hmm. and they also use special cameras that are looking specifically for, uh, I believe they actually put transceivers in the down markers to help them see where those, those marks mm-hmm. need to be. Yeah. 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 That would make sense just because you, you can often see the yellow first down line superimposed on a screen in college football in the NFL, even when it's like a side view camera, it's it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not like a a typical view because that, that was what my follow-up was going to be, which you just answered with the, with the, with the transceivers bit. Um, Because in particular, you often can't see the full field, even from the, the quote unquote normal uh, camera view, because Mm -hmm. the field is proportionally very wide, 33 and a third yards wide i think it's 100 feet wide or um i can never remember the dimensions yeah it, it's well it's 100 yards by 100 feet so 33 and a third yards um which is you know proportionally very big i mean that's you know a third of the length of the whole field which when you think about it you typically only see like from the typical camera view like maybe 25 yards left to right so you're not going to see you know in a in a in a night or a 16 by nine frame you're not going to see as many yards up to down so that's right but yeah a little cool piece of graphics technology that you know came out of the nfl because that was a that was something they wanted to enhance viewership of Mm -hmm. professional football and now they tried it the nhl where they had the hockey puck with like the 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 uh glowing tail (laughs) yeah and that didn't last what, thankfully what they they got rid of the tail but they do actually still highlight the puck to make it more visible i i believe i think yeah they could do the, a little the bit the puck of that, is but... a little bit bigger than it actually is like on on the screen it appears bigger than it actually is oh that makes I, sense i believe I, I that's that. the case but i i'm the, the they got rid of the tail because it looks stupid but uh yeah, um, yeah. anyway while we're, on, while we're on the subject of graphics, let, let me jump into my first question. Undo it. All of the consoles that came out were talked well, except the Switch, but that, that's because it's not really pushing for high-end graphics. All of the consoles that are coming out, all the graphics cards that are coming out, keep talking about ray tracing. Ray tracing, mm-hmm. ray tracing, ray tracing. So first... You, our friend Ray Pettit, we want to trace yeah. him yes. outline. Yeah. Yep. In, in fact, you may not know this, um, Ray Pettit contracts out with Microsoft, Sony, and NVIDIA. Uh, not wow. AMD, though. They actually use a different Ray for that. <laughs> um, no, but... but his, his rates are too high. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's right. bad. <laughs> well, thank you all for listening to the podcast. So, why... Or first, what is ray tracing? And second, why is there so much emphasis placed on it right now? Is this just the blast processing that Sega came that came out with as a marketing tool mm, with the blast Sega? Processing. By the way, blast processing was a real thing that the Sega yep. Genesis could do that literally no game released ever did. No really? game released on the Sega Genesis used blast processing. It was a way to change the color palette midway through drawing the screen on a CRT TV, but it required so many resources and so much technical synchronization that no game ever actually used blast processing. I just assumed it was part of the frame rate management for nope. handling fast games like Sonic. Oh no, no, that was huh. that was part of the graphics card. Yes. But blast huh. processing was a very specific thing that no one used. Literally, 
not a single Genesis game. So, so is ray tracing just that, just a marketing gimmick? Well, first, let's talk about how 3D graphics work. Really, you know, there were some very, very rudimentary 3D graphics on the Genesis and SNES, but they were exceedingly limited, so much so that, you know, you, you talk about, like, go back and look at Star Fox and it, 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 on the Super Nintendo, and it did some polygon stuff, but it just doesn't look great at all. Um, so once you start getting into Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1, that's where you start to see the shift from two-dimensional being the norm to three-dimensional being the norm. Not th- right. there, were th- yep. there were 3D-ish games with Mode 7 and all that on Super Nintendo. Eh, 2.5. Yeah. And there were some actual 3D games, albeit they didn't look great. But <laughs> mainly PlayStation 1, Nintendo 64, and Sega... Um, was it? Th- 30- it wasn't the... T- Dreamcast, I think it was the, the... The Saturn? The Saturn was around the same time. That was Nights into Dreams, if that helps. Yeah. So, I, 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 I linked an image to Sheriff, and this will be linked in the show description. Um, one of the big advantages that we got as we got more memory on the games, you know, more processing power, was each polyhedron that represents a character on the screen or a tree, or a building, or some feature, or whatever, more polygons makes it look better. It makes it look more smooth. You know, it doesn't change the size of the object, it just improves the definition. But the thing is, around the time, and, you know, not that long, around the time of the Xbox 360 and PS3, we actually started to see some games that, at least for particular graphics, particular things, there was enough polygons that it looked quite realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with Xbox 360, there's some characters in Mass Effect 2 and 3, for example, that are rendered extremely well, despite the Xbox 360 only having a half a gig of RAM. Mm. That's not much. That is for, not much. For, I mean, for reference, you know, that's, that's not much. Yeah. And so as we've moved into the PlayStation 4 and an and Xbox One era, I think that the Xbox One, I, their numbering system makes no I sense. Know. People noticed that graphics didn't really improve that much. They improved, but not nearly yeah, the right. jump that we saw from PS2 to PS3, for example. And then now PS5 comes out, and I'll be honest, most of the games don't look that much better that have been released for both. They just load faster. At least in terms of of the definition of objects. Right, yes. And so the thing is, we've actually kind of hit a point where throwing more triangles at a polyhedron doesn't improve what the object looks like. Even a tenfold increase in the number of triangles in a particular polyhedron doesn't make it look better to the human eye. Because all that extra definition, at that point, you get this radical falling off of diminishing returns. Right. And, and, and just so people know, this is one of the ways that you do 3D modeling is you have the points yeah. uh, that, that make the outer you know, shell of the mm-hmm. object and you make a bunch of triangles that link them all together because triangles right. are nice because they're nice and bendy. And they're easy for graphics cards to render. Right. And if, you have, if you have three given points, you you only have one possible triangle from that. Whereas if you picked four points, you could have different quadrilaterals from that. Anyway. Yep. So why does this matter to ray tracing? Ray tracing has nothing to do with polygons on the face of it. Ray tracing is not even new. There's ray tracing that existed in the 90s. Whoa. There, I, I don't know if you heard of a movie called Toy Story. <laughs> they had ray tracing uh, in it. Hi, everyone. Just a quick interjection here. I just said that the movie Toy Story used ray tracing. That statement is incorrect. I was wrong. How dare I? Uh, the first movies that were uh, fully digitally generated animated movies that use ray tracing were Monster House and Shrek 2. 
Those are from the early to mid 2000s, so they're still a lot older than ray tracing and gaming, but Toy Story didn't use ray tracing until actually Toy Story 4 because Disney Pixar's engine did not support ray tracing until then. So just keep that in mind as we proceed through the rest of this episode, and sorry about the incorrection. You're, you are talking to a bona fide Disney fanatic, and yeah. what is this Toy Story you were talking about? Yeah, I, Shrek I, yeah. had ray tracing. Now, now Toy Story didn't have much ray tracing, but so what, what, why is this all of a sudden a new thing? Well, so what, what is ray tracing first? It is a way of simulating lighting by actually treating light as millions of photons going out from a light source. And so typically we've been doing lighting, like kind of faking it kind of like, Oh, there's kind of a light up here. So we just kind of put a little shine Mm -hmm. down here. This is like light, like for real, like we're going to model the light. Yeah. And and it's like, and so an example of that is if you play uh, the original halo, there's actually only one light source at every time. And the like the lasers and all that don't actually emit light. They're just brightly colored uh, in the original Halo because and it that turns light, out that and the, that light is Master Chief because he is the one hope for the universe. I, it's usually a light in a room anyway. Uh, OK, uh, all it's, right. it's usually anyway. So <laughs> the thing is, this is computationally very expensive. Now, in movies, this isn't a problem because in movies you. You know, you you generate the graphics that you want, or you you set the program up to to produce the graphics you want to move the polygons in the way you want them to move, and then you render. And you know, if it takes you two days to render five minutes of animation, well, that's not a problem because it's not like someone is sitting in the movie theater waiting two days for you to finish. They're only <laughs> going to see the final product when all the rendering is done for the whole movie. Rendering by in this case meaning actually producing the out the output video. Yeah, hitting that save that magic right. save button. So this gets actually uh, very similar to what we were talking about with, for example, the first downline doing the static versus the dynamic in terms of overlays. With with ray tracing and gaming, the issue is we have to do it on demand because the game is not scripted. The game reacts to the player. It has to mm-hmm. change what it does based on the player's interaction. So the difference really isn't that ray tracing is a new technology. It's that real-time ray tracing has started to be achievable because of increases, uh, both from a technological standpoint, we have better processors, uh, faster memory, etc., but also... Uh, we have new algorithms that help simplify some of those calculations. So mm-hmm. why are we spending so much time and energy on this? Well, because improving the lighting can dramatically improve the visual quality without increasing the number of polygons. In fact, you can't increase polygons enough to make the lighting look good. So that that's why. It, it, it's an emphasis trying to make the lighting look better because if you have very realistic shapes but bad lighting, it's still not going to look great. Uh, we'll link some shots of mm. maybe maybe uh, the Spider-Man, Miles Morales. With well, I, I mean, I could actually just get uh, get out my PS5 and I could show control with, with ray tracing and without ray tracing. And I could just hey, 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 record Will, a bit hey, of Will. Yeah. This this is an audio medium, and uh, you getting out your uh, PS5 and playing I'm, it right now is not going to... I could upload it to YouTube, and then we could link it in the video description. Oh, I guess that would work, too. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah, cool. I, yeah, I... It, and this is one of the reasons why um, the new graphics cards that many people cannot get their hands on... Yeah. <laughs> that RTX... That R, I, b- I believe yeah. the R is about ray tracing specifically. Yeah, so, uh, so RTX is speci- it, RTX is not ray tracing. It is uh, NVIDIA's approach to handling ray tracing. And okay, the last generation of graphics cards, the the 2000 series, were the first RTX series, I believe, because uh, before that it was GTX. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, no, you, no one can get their hands on them. Although it's getting better. It's not good okay. yet. It's not good yet. No, no. no. All right. Speaking of things that are in scarcity, uh, I'm going to we're going to give a shot at this one. I'm going to do my best to put on my computer engineering, electrical engineering hat. And uh, Will, have you heard of this this pandemic that's going around? I hear there's this. Is that, that's this, the board game, right? That's the board game. It's really good. Um, it, it really it, I can't play it. I mean, it's on my shelf and I'm like, wow, I really wanted to play Pandemic Legacy. And I'm like, no, I don't want to look at this anymore. But something else that has gone into scarcity are chips yes semiconductors and this this uh, you you hear that there's this huge semiconductor shortage yep. which is part and parcel of what's going on with the rtx mm -hmm. and some of the some of the the uh the the consoles as well and um you also hear it's also why there are cars that are not being made or their are cars yep. that have been created that, that are built but they are sitting i believe some of them are sitting at like the nashville speedway just waiting for the final step which is to have these magic chips installed. And so mm -hmm. let's see if we can talk about what actually is happening here. Okay. So first it is a semiconductor shortage. What is a semiconductor? Well, a conductor is something that, well, it conducts electricity, a semiconductor. Well, kind of, kind of conducts yeah. <laughs> it. It like half conducts it. But what's important here is that it's a very controlled movement electricity yes. and depending on how you make that semiconductor material you can bond it with different other other materials i think tungsten is one of them mm -hmm. and uh looking here phosphorus is another one it actually can change the reactivity of the material mm -hmm. okay why is this interesting well semiconductors are or the material that that semiconductors are, are, are created into make up the silicone chips that go inside what we will just generally call microchips, but they're really called an integrated circuit. Right. And so many times what you'll see, if you rip open a, a piece of electronics, you'll find a little black flat box, several of them. And each of these little flat black boxes have little metal tines on them that are then um, uh, soldered into a full circuit board yep. and the combination of all of these put together, makes some sort of interesting piece of electronics. Okay. Well, what does the microchip do? What does the integrated circuit do? Well, what are some things that circuits do anyway? Uh, in many cases, it are things like I put in some amount of electricity on one side on pins one, two, and five. And then on the other side, electricity comes out on pins 12, 17, and 16, because I've added two numbers together and that's what comes out the other side. So things like adders and subtractors and timers, things that, you know, will keep a steady rhythm based upon uh, the, the electricity that's coming in. Some other things that could be created on these, these integrated circuits are sensors. So something like a temperature sensor is often built into its own integrated circuit microchip that's put in there. So when I start talking about sensors, these are things that modern cars use a lot of now they'll go in the tires to find out air pressure mm -hmm. whether your tires have full pressure or not they're the ones that go with lane assist mm -hmm. um that that are monitoring your you know the, the the white line to see if you're about to go over or not now individually these chips don't really do much of anything it's just when they are put together in a larger circuit board that they can then move forward so Okay, so that's kind of what we're talking about. That's what the 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 the, the semiconductor is the shortage. The chips are what's made, the microchips, the integrated circuits are what's made out of them. Why is there a shortage? Well, pandemic hits and Ford and Toyota and Subaru and everyone says, well, we're probably not making as many cars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one's going anywhere. So we're just gonna not order as much of those particular components because mm -hmm. they're kind of expensive. We might want new ones. Let's just not buy them. Right. And so this is a supply chain thing. And it goes all the way down to the people who make the semiconductors. And they say, okay, we're going to turn down that big lever that turns down semiconductors. And it slowly ramps down production of those. Right. But this is not something where it's like, oh, we need more now. And it just doesn't turn back on. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes the lead time is months. Right. To get the material needed to get to get back into it. Right. There's, there's a lot of processing time. It's not 
it's not just, you know, making it's not like making a pizza where you just do it in an hour. It's something that takes a long time to do. And it takes a lot of materials that are not necessarily something you just have like lying around like, you know, phosphorus. You know, yeah. it, it, you, these are things that um, have to be uh, appropriated and stored in a particular way. And if they're not being used immediately, then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is it going to get better? Yeah. But what did this expose? It exposed some some uh, supply line issues um, it, it exposed like how, how sensitive we are to certain uh, pieces of technology going away. But I wanted to make sure we touched on one particular thing. One reason there is not a chip shortage is because Microsoft bought them all up to put them in COVID-19 vaccines. That is not happening. No, no, no. That, that was not. <laughs> um, although uh, not Microsoft, but but Android and Apple did stockpile a bunch of microchips uh, actually anticipating that the shortage would occur. Wow. So that, that did chip, happen. Chip so they features. could keep making phones. So they, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another, uh, there's another issue that I, I think people aren't aware of that while it's not, I don't think it's as much contributing right now to the shortage. There's something on the horizon that I think people need to be aware of. There is a sand shortage. I know that sounds insane, right? There's sand everywhere, right? But the thing is, only particular types of sand are ideal for concrete, are ideal for glass, and are ideal Mm -hmm. for microchips. Um, Specifically, desert sand is too smooth. Uh, (laughs) It's been been eroded too consistently for too long. I'm just too smooth to be in your concrete. I'm just a smooth operator. Yeah. Well, but so this is why, for example, um, the Arabian Peninsula countries import a lot of sand, which you may think, wait, that doesn't seem like something they have a shortage of. But it's because the sand in the Arabian deserts is very old sand. So it's very smooth, which means it doesn't bind well in concrete specifically. And so... <laughs> They have to import sand to use for concrete. And sand is actually something that is becoming a a resource that a lot of global economists are worried about because it turns out the particular right kind of sand that is used for, for glass and concrete and microchips are more rare than you would think because you think, well, sand is everywhere. And it's not. Yeah. Interesting. That's that's not I, the reason for the particular shortage now, but that is something that I think is going to be a factor people have to start thinking about soon. Reduce, reuse, recycle sand. I, speaking of that, just really quick, another another quick tidbit based upon kind of the microchips and things like that. I didn't realize this till today when I saw an article about it that all of the medals in the Olympics mm-hmm. are from reclaimed metals from cell phones and huh. other pieces of technology yeah. that d- Japan collected it was uh let me let me get the this is uh i don't have the article up right now but it was like thousands of tons this is reported by the usa today thousands of tons of material from recycled cell phones Mm -hmm. uh televisions electronics all of which have a small amount of each of these metals in them yeah um which is another reason why you should never throw out your well there's many reasons you shouldn't throw away your electronic devices they all should be recycled even though i know it's a real pain in the tail Mm -hmm. to try and take them to a official recycling Mm -hmm. event for electronics but there's a lot of stuff in there that doesn't need to go back in the ground in bad ways and could be turned into i don't know olympic medals which is cool all right well now for something completely different okay what makes rubber duck debugging work are you familiar with the term? Excuse, excuse, excuse me, say, say this again. R- what rubber, makes rubber, rubber duck? duck debugging work? Okay. Have you ever this done rubber I duck t- debugging? I, I assume this is where I take a rubber duck and squish the house centipede that is running past my daughter in the bathtub. That's rubber duck debugging. Uh, no. No, that is... <laughs> that is... um. That I guess that well I guess technically 
It's, it's violence um, against one of God's creatures, and I am uh, doomed for all eternity. But n- um, so, uh, House Centipede, I don't know. That's I don't know if that's I don't know if that's one of the big guys. That's uh, them suckers kind of gross. All right, so okay, what is rubber duck to bugging? <laughs> I have it no is, blessed clue. I've never heard you, of this. You, you actually haven't. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I've no. only been teaching software engineering for two decades. Please. Okay. Tell me. <laughs> so the idea of rubber duck debugging is that you have some type of thing on your desk that you can amp- anthropomorphize. It does not have to be a rubber duck. It could be a teddy bear. It could be a stapler if your imagination is good enough. The point is something that you could actually pretend is, is something to talk at. Oh, then I've definitely done this because. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. All right. All right I'm, I'm going to say anyway. So, so one of my one of my good friends in graduate school came back from home from India, and he presented each of us in our research group a hand carved camel. Okay. And so it got to be the point that our research advisor, whenever we wrote a paper, her way of telling us we needed to go like read it aloud is go read it to the camel, and exactly. that was. That was our that was our euphemism that was our term for that is that yeah. is exactly what rubber duck debugging is and it just so happened that rubber ducks were particularly popular uh, because they're easy enough to find so that is what it is you are going to you're you're looking at your code you're saying I don't understand where this bug is you then explain the code to a rubber duck now why. Does this work? Because here's the thing. Mm, many people will tell you this works. And the duck, uh, many people also tell you the duck has not yet responded. Well, one of the reasons <laughs> that <silence>. it, <laughs> one, one of the reasons that it works is because we have a lot of glitches in our brain, a lot of short, a lot of shortcuts that our brain takes whenever we're working on something. Mm-hmm. You know, and the pro- the problem is those create blind spots that we don't anticipate. And this is why it's very hard to proofread your own writing. But yet, if you read what Oof. someone else writes, you'll very easily catch the typos. And it's just because when you're typing, you know what you mean. And so your brain, even when you go back and try to review and edit, your brain short circuits what you mean into what you're reading. Oh, and sure. so you All will the miss the typo. And the mm-hmm. same idea occurs with debugging or with writing code. <laughs> so this is why, for example, uh, this is this is an exercise that I did as a student. We had to go to the writing center, and what the writing center had us do wasn't okay. We'll read the paper and tell you what it is. They had us read the paper aloud, and I'm thinking mm-hmm. oh, this is a waste of time because you know I was 18 and knew everything. Uh, as, as, <laughs> as 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 one does at as the, every every at the, knows at the everything. sage age of of eighteen, and mm. so I was like, "That's ridiculous! I can't believe I have to proofread." And so I, I start reading it aloud, and I realize that as I'm reading it aloud, I am finding all of the typos that are just patently obvious. I had proofread my paper before I went there and didn't see these, but the act of reading them aloud to another person made me catch them. The other person didn't ca- I mean, the other person, of course, caught some of the things I missed, which a rubber duck, n- sorry, is not going to do. The rubber duck's going to be like, whoa, 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 I think you have, you're making a logical <laughs> fallacy there. Quack. Quack. <laughs> quack. Quack, 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 quack. No. Um, but the very act of, of going through that process forces you to skip those shortcuts in your brain. You uh-huh. have to think through them. And so assumptions that you may take for granted may be incorrect. Uh, also, part of this is humans, by all accounts, appear to have not evolved to reason honestly. We've evolved to reason socially. By that, it means that we don't use reason often as a tool to get to some intrinsic underlying truth. We use reason to convince each other of things. Mm. This is, there's a great Vsauce video on this uh, called The Future of Reason. Highly recommend watching it. Uh, it's, it's the most recent long-form Vsauce video. And 
that has a lot of negative manifestations, especially in the world of social media. But specifically when it comes to writing code, it allows us to ignore obvious glaring faults in our code because we short circuit in our brain a path to saying that's what we meant. So this is a way to break ourselves out of that cycle to try to engage in some type of social reasoning where we're more likely to see uh, where, where faults are more likely to be presented to us, even if the thing we're presenting our arguments to is inanimate because the act of having to defend your ideas is what enables you to correct the mistakes in them. Well, you know, honestly, I've caught so many mistakes when lecturing, and it might as well have been an inanimate object at the same time, considering some of the reactions <laughs> we've gotten from the, the black rectangles. Yeah, the black rectangles. But I, I think it's important to, to make sure that you know, you, you you talk about this in terms of reading your code. But you know, my first example was reading a paper. Exactly. Your primary example is reading a paper. This this applies to any piece of creative or any part, anything of output that mm-hmm. a person has. Whenever you self-reflect upon it, that gives you some sort of insight into it. But it's only when you are trying to communicate that to other people that you really actually um, that you really actually find those uh, those those issues, those mm-hmm. those problems, those things that you want to correct. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Well, that takes us to the end of four questions. As I count my my question from the Olympics, okay. which All I right. think was good, <laughs> I'll allow unless it. you you'll allow it. Well, that's that is that is good. Well, uh, Will, it's good to have you back again this week. It was it was lonely without you last week. Yeah, just um, just burn out from the end of the uh, end of the end of the class. Uh, yeah. Hit, hang on, I, I I do have one one little simple quick little uh, if I if I can just slip this in. Um, oh, wait, where did it go? Oh, here's a question from Arcade. Is there a way to get my librarians back after they were just killed by zombies? Huh? The librarians? I know, right? I, I was just I, at the I'm library. I'm to a librarian. I was just at the library today. Like, and apparently zombies showed up after that. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, I want to keep my life. Well, I, I'm I gonna have to keep to the run. books now, right? You have it. They're all yours. I have to go make sure that that my librarian is okay. If you have enjoyed anything that you have heard, we would very much appreciate if you would subscribe to the show on the podcast service of your choice, be it iTunes, Apple Podcasts, which is the same thing, but it used to be iTunes, whatever, still Apple Podcast, Spotify, um, or just go to Anchor uh, FM. You can get there at regraderequest.com. We would love it if you would submit questions to us. You can do that by going to regraderequest.com and recording an audio message right there for us to put into the show. Or you could email us, hosts at regraderequest.com, mark at regraderequest.com, or will at regraderequest.com. So, for myself and Professor Will McBurney, it's great to have you with us. As always, take care, stay safe, and remember, watch for falling goats. Take care. Uh, did, when they do when they do ray tracing the goat simulator, do they simulate the photons with falling goats? I, I hope they do. I was actually thinking much more about what sort of goat Olympics we needed. Goat Olympic skateboarding? That sounds, that sounds awesome. Yeah, but there'd be a lot of fun.